one man. Moi? One star. That one? The Daily Space Weather. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Smash News Network, the least busted name in news. We had some machinations of the closest star in the past 24 hours and some machinations of the SDO as well. That's a calibration maneuver you see there. It makes sure that it is aimed directly at the center of the Earth-facing solar disk. And here are some of those machinations. There was a huge CME or two that came out of the western limb in the past 24 hours. Now, the biggest news in space weather is that there is a major geomagnetic storm possible. We could see as high as a upper KP7s, maybe even a KP8. I'm saying the highest will probably be like 7.66. It all depends on the magnetic field strength and orientation. So it's exciting times. We'll even talk about later in the video whether or not those latest coronal mass ejections coming out of the western limb have earthly directed components. A large sunspot has risen in the northeast. It doesn't have a lot of magnetic shear though. So it is becoming less likely to produce a large solar flare as it rotates closer to the center portion of the Earth-facing solar disk. There is a huge prominence hanging out at the southern polar region there. I did clip a little bit of that off. We also have a decreasing likelihood of large solar flares coming from this area down here. That is a fleeting possibility that still does remain. It is on the way out. So we'll be waiting for that sunspot to possibly rise again on the eastern limb. So yeah, it's uh, exciting times. We're hoping for the possibility of some mid-latitude aurorae tonight. So if you enjoy the content, by the way, don't forget to check out the links below the video. One of the ways you can support the channel is by picking up some merch. When will you stop believing NASA's lies? When are you going to come to grips with the fact that Earth is shaped like the French breakfast pastry, not an oblate spheroid? Not a pizza disc with Antarctica stretching around the edge of the flat planet under which, over which is a sky dome or something. Get real, folks. Earth is shaped like a croissant. And we encourage you to stop believing NASA's lies today. Didn't you know NASA was founded by, founded by actual Nazis? Yeah, actual Nazis founded NASA. What are you, crazy? You ever hear of Operation Paperclip? What are you, some kind of nut job? I mean, geez, get with the program, folks. NASA, they have huge incentive to convince you that the planet is shaped like a sphere. It's not 2,000-year-old information or anything. It's cutting edge or something. You can find links below the video to the merch shop as well as on our homepage at smashomash.com. You can also find more products for your shopping requirements at the Amazon shop. We just added a book in there called Unmasked just this morning. You can find some reading, spaceware, amusement. Those are the best Frisbees you'll ever find. Battery backups in the camping supplies. Even some of the cycling gear that I'll actually endorse. Amazon.com slash shop slash smash -a -mash. Links on the homepage and below the video to that as well. And the GOES got some better footage of those CMEs, so let's take a look at that. Give that a minute to spool up, and yowzers, that is pretty freaking sweet. So one of the many reasons to visit the Smash Team page at smashomash.com slash smash team. You would have seen this streaming yesterday. You can see some hider flares happening there as some of that ejecta splash back down toward the chromosphere. The chromosphere is sort of the middle layer of the sun's atmosphere in between the corona and the photosphere, which we would call the surface of the solar body. Anyway, yeah, that's uh, some pretty sweet imagery, wouldn't you say? It's really two events there, two rather quite separate events there happening in a short time frame. So yeah, <laughs> exciting stuff there. 
And uh, let's take a brief look at sunspots here. We've got yesterday plus today's images. And not a lot of changes happening there. Most of those sunspot groups remaining stable for the past 24 hours. Again, that depicts yesterday plus today. That's all day on July 19th plus today so far on 720. Here's the colorized magnetogram for that same period. These are all from SDO. Use the browse data section if you want to get imagery like this. And let's take a look at what's going on on planet Earth for a brief moment. We've got an Icelandic uptick in volcanic activity. So there is, it looks like they've moved the camera for that one. Great view of that lava flow, even though it is light out. So here are the rest of the volcanoes that are erupting. This is our list. Mount Mayan continues to produce a 9,000-foot volcanic ash plume. It's a flight level 090. Flight level 070 over Ibu as it explodes on the Isle of Halmahera. It's a 7,000-foot ash plume. Krakatau now back on the list. Another violent eruptive episode there. Five-kilometer exclusion zone around the volcanic island of Krakatau. Daughter of Krakatoa. Stay 5K away from Krakatau, please. Semeru also exploding, flight level 140. That's a 14,000 foot ash plume. Minor volcanic emissions. That's like three miles high. Cleveland in the Aleutian Island now exhibiting an increasing number of earthquakes. The Cleveland volcano, elevated surface temperatures and continuing gas emissions have raised the volcanic alert level to yellow. Popocatépetl exploding in central Mexico, flight level 200. Sancho Guito did some stuff like pyroclastic flows and produced a 14 to 15,000 foot plume of volcanic ash as it exploded and extruded lava. So that's uh, that's not a good thing to be hanging around. Stay, stay the heck away from volcanic exclusion zones. Don't get in a pyroclastic flow. That is not the optimal way to go. Fuego in Guatemala also exploding. Flight level 160. It's a 16,000 foot ash plume, 20,000 foot ash plume from Nevado de Ruiz in Colombia, 22,000 foot ash plume from Sabancaya in Peru. Ubinas also exploding in that same nation, 20,000 foot ash plume there. It's a flight level 200. Let's see what's going on as far as earthquake activity. There's the past 90 days. And shut up, smash staff. Here is the last 24 hours, and we will mention quakes that are of a five or greater magnitude. Indonesia had a 5.2 at 1518 universal time yesterday afternoon. And by the way, thanks for tuning into the Smash News Network, the busted name in news. There was also a 5.4 at the South Make Me a Sandwich Islands region. That was at 1615, so just under an hour later there. Also, Indonesia had a 5.0 that was at 2308 Universal Time yesterday evening. It was at extreme depth, over 200 kilometers estimated depth. The Rat Islands of the Aleutians had a 5.0 that was at 2356 Universal Time and also at depth, 117.7 kilometers estimated depth. Kermadec Islands had a 5.0 at 324 this morning. Indonesia had a 5.1 at 331 this morning. Only seven minutes later. And the Rakhonis Ridge continues to exhibit significant earthquake activity. Let's take a look at some more solar data here. And this is what's going on in 171 Angstroms from SDO. Another 24 hour video. And here we've added 211 Angstroms. To highlight the extended corona, 171 angstroms depict the lower corona. This shows great depth and coronal holes, which we will get to here in a minute. 10.7 centimeter radio flux is currently at 189 solar flux units. And for your new viewers out there, thanks for tuning in. The 10.7 centimeter radio flux is the most proportional piece of data to sunspot number during a solar sunspot cycle. <clears throat> so there you may see the relationship between the red line and the black line, the red line being the sunspot number and the black line being the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. 
So currently at 189 solar flux units. Solar flux units are 10,000 Jansky of radio flux density. And here is our space weather enthusiast dashboard. And again, they, have, they haven't changed the warning since yesterday. So same warning as they were saying yesterday. Uh, there is some small possibility of a G3 level geomagnetic storm. So that's that KP7 kind of a range. So they do kind of agree here. It all depends on the magnetic field strength and orientation, folks. If we have a strong field and a strong negative BZ component to that magnetic field, you can expect to see the possibility of a KP7+. plus. If not, probably not. So we'll be prepared to go out and take video of the Aurora if we have clear skies tonight, and we hope you do too. That's the Space Weather Enthusiast dashboard expecting the CME impact to strike around 1500 universal time, so only in a couple hours. So let's blast through the rest of this video. Here's the past four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space. And this is the calm before the storm, folks. It is very geomagnetically calm. We should get a very significant signal. It'll be a very obvious coronal mass ejection impact. Expected to show up at about sometime between 1500 and 1800 universal time today on July 20th. So the past four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from space certainly looking pretty calm. That's our geospace magnetosphere movie. Here's our ground magnetic perturbations map. The last four hours of Earth's magnetic moment from ground level. And this is one of the great maps to consult if you think you may be able to see the aurora in your area. And let me show you my favorite map and how to find it. So if you do think the aurora is going to strike and you may have some ability to view it, head to the Space Weather Prediction Center and one of the links that you'll find there is uh, this right here, the geoelectric field models, US and Canada. So this creates induction in the power system. There it is in real time. So when CMEs impact, that is some great data to check out. So if a CME does show up, you can consult that to see the possibility of whether or not your grid is getting a lot of induction into it, but it'll also increase the likelihood that you'll be able to get some real-time-ish, some near real-time data. This depicts uh, millivolts per kilometer in the U.S. and Canada power grid. So it's very good at showing you where the aurora are likely to be visible. KP index currently only at 0.67. Again, very geomagnetically calm at the moment. And the real-time solar wind here, quite unremarkable, although we are seeing some perturbations happening already here. So, But current conditions are, let's say, uh, 439 kilometers a second for the solar wind speed. Solar wind density here, about 2 and a quarter protons per cubic centimeter. And again, that top pane there is the really important pane. That top pane right there. If you see this white line go up, and the red line go down, a divergence in those two lines. The red line being the BZ, that's the vertical component of the magnetic field. If we see a strong BZ to the negative and we see a strong BT, that's the total field strength, expect fireworks and expect to see the aurora at mid-latitudes. Those magnetometers here are in a very nominal range there, very unremarkable. Expect that to be all over the place when that major CME impact happens. Next our top view ecliptic plane field plot and this depicts data from ground-based magnetometers as well as magnetometers on stereo A and stereo B and we've got a sector boundary crossing still not here. So the North Pole current sheet will be arriving sometime in the next 24 hours it looks like. Here you can see that sector boundary crossing that's the last image. This depicts actually four days of the heliospheric current sheet's polarity. As the floodgates are open to solar cycle 25 cycle maximum, expect another year and a half or so of similar levels of solar activity. It's an exciting time to be doing space weather. And here is our line of sight field plot. Looking more and more like solar maximum, but guess what folks, we aren't there yet. This depicts the solar B field in blue, north and south 
polar fields in green and red respectively. The gray scale is the gong magnetogram, which brings us to our line of sight coronal hole plot. North pole coronal holes rotating in here, there in the east and southeast. South pole coronal holes here just rotating out of center disk. Again, sector boundary crossing coming. And before we get to sunspots, let's take a look at coronal holes here from SDO's perspective. There is the past 24 hours, and you can see those south pole oriented coronal holes there. Draped across the middle of the solar disk. North Pole coronal holes rotating in there in the east. Those will become more well-defined in the coming days as the sector boundary crossing shows up. And let's move to sunspots. Yeah, sunspots. So there's the current situation for sunspots. No major changes. Let me just spool up the SDO intensity gram here. 3379 got a name. The next active group will be known as 3380. The next time we see new Umbra form or rise, 3380 will be the name of the next group. And here is the full disk zoom on the equator. That is yesterday plus today, July 19th and July 20th to date. So no major changes happening. Some Umbra migration happening there in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, most sunspots now showing up in the Northern Hemisphere. And it is an exciting time for space weather. Ghost proton flux here continues to subside. We're expecting those polar radio blackouts to cease pretty soon. You should see those turning into brownouts throughout the day today as that proton flux dips, assuming we don't have any more relativistic particle infusions. Those are called solar energetic particle events, folks. And uh, see yesterday's video. We talked a little bit, or two days ago, actually, uh, Tuesday's video, we talked a little more extensively about SEPs. There you can see the southern polar region's radio blackouts are largely radio brownouts. The North Pole, it is summertime in the north. Those are still blacked out, but those, again, they should be subsiding sometime soon, assuming we don't get hit with another SEP, solar energetic particle event. Relativistic particles that the sun blasts out at a significant percentage of light speed. They get trapped in Earth's magnetic field lines, and as they orbit those, they emit radiation, and there you go, radio blackouts at the poles. The equatorial radio blackouts are caused by solar flares, known as X-rays. A great example of how protons and photons do very different things in the Earth system. So that is a way you can monitor solar flares and solar energetic particle events together in near real time, the deabsorption region predictions. It depicts the attenuation of the D layer of the ionosphere. So at about 100 kilometers of altitude, that's where that layer is. Radio signals are blasting out into space instead of refracting back down from the polar regions to their earthly targets. X-ray flux here has actually dipped in the past couple days. We went from a background flux level of C2 to a background flux level of C1.2. So a little bit of a decrease there in the X-ray flux as some very active sunspots have set in the west. And let's take a look at the situation from the SDO Space Weather Station. <clears throat> so there's the past 24 hours in 131 angstroms. And the likelihood of major solar flares has gone down a bit here. So we don't just come on the channel every day and say, hey, it's a, there, it could be an X-class flare about to happen. It has to do with the magnetic shear of those active sunspot regions. Here's 94 angstroms for the same time period, a 24-hour video. So a little bit of a dip in the X-ray flux overall there and a little dip in the likelihood of a major flare. And let's see what's going on overhead over Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. So that's where we're located. We're located in Lehigh Valley. And there's a star chart for the current situation. You've got Saturn and Jupiter up there and also Mercury trailing the sun and also a tiny sliver of a moon 
So it's a good time to view the dusk sky, as if you're viewing the dusk sky, you'll be able to see perhaps Mercury if you've got low light pollution. And then Mars, Venus, and the Moon all very close together there on both sides of the ecliptic. So fingers crossed for <laughs> exciting activity tonight. We might be taking imagery of that dusk sky ourselves, especially if we have a raging space weather storm, a, a, a raging solar storm or a geomagnetic storm, whatever you want to call it. Here's your solar system forecast before we talk coronal mass ejections. Things today are here. Things in a week will be there. We will have a gibbous waxing moon by the 27th of July. Unfortunately, we've got some missing data from George Mason University's coronagraphs for whatever reason. Here are the Soho Lasco C2 and C3. There you can see that CME popping off. It is looking like it's out of the west and northwest. And there it goes. And it is not a case of here it comes. Because it is not earthly directed based on the data that we see here. So we'll also show Stereo A. Feel free to pause the video on this frame. You can see Stereo A and B are very close to Earth right now as they overtake each other. So we paused this at 1.23 this morning to get a great still image of that CME. There you can see that popping off. Does not appear to have any earthly directed components. So we'll bring this back to the beginning of the day yesterday. Keep in mind those are not synced, but they do show time and date stamps. So no halo, no likely earthly directed component from that one. It's just a spectacular light show put on by the closest star. So let's take a look at our custom 24 hour videos. There you go, there is the last 24 in SDO 193 angstroms plus the Soho Lasco C2 in red and C3 in blue. Here's a little closer view. And here's an even closer view. And here's just 94 angstroms by itself. Not 94, 193 angstroms. What am I talking about? All right, so next we'll talk about filaments. And we've certainly got some that might be worthy of names. Let us know in the comments what you think. Or better yet, let us know on Twitter if you'd like to name filaments after living people. This one here, no longer getting a name because, whoops, it's gone. It is headed out through the greater solar system. But there is a huge one over here. That one could get a name. So, if, again, if you want to name filaments after living people, just follow us over on Twitter. Twitter.com slash smash mash All over the internet at smash mash That is the ground-based solar observatory at El Tai de Spain. We've got at least three major filaments on the Earth-facing portion of the solar disk. You might be able to see them in the GOES-18 SUVI imagery. We've also got prominences at both polar regions. And we've got some activity right here in the center of the solar disk. We also still do have a fleeting possibility of a major flare from this group. You can still see some brightening down there. Those flares, they happen high enough in the corona that we can get a major solar flare even when sunspots are not visible. These are just facts. And let's break out some more facts in getting into our bonus features segment. Yeah, bonus features, starting out with satellite charging hazards. We show them daily because people are going to say if their communications shut down, they're going to be like, it's China. China and Russia shut down our satellites. A lot of people are out there blaming humans for stuff that is caused by nature. At the moment, no charging hazards for satellites. The GOES electron flux is still at quite normal levels here. Nothing to write home about there. 
and you may see a precipitous dip in this in just a few hours. As anomalous readings show up, the ionosphere puffs up and space weather comes down. So here is the one-year graph of the relativistic electrons to put that last data set in context. So there's a three-day graph and there is a one-year graph. High to moderate ranges here may see a sudden dip. Let's see NOAA's forecast. NOAA's forecasting just a moderate dip. So yeah, I mean, you can, you can continue to see high electron flux levels even when CMEs impact, but sometimes they dip. <laughs> so, I mean, feel free to read the, the tabs on these pages, folks. It does include some information that you may be about to ask me in the comments section, but you can feel free to ask me in the comments section as well. Anyway, we'll also show the F layer of the ionosphere. That's the portion of the atmosphere where that is measured. And there's the D layer we talked about earlier there at 100 kilometers of altitude. The F layer is what we're talking about now at 300 kilometers of altitude. And there is the vibrational frequency of that layer. You can expect to see this show a lot of low frequency anomalies in tomorrow's daily space weather video. So make sure you tune in for that. We go through all the data daily so you don't have to. It's fact dense material on our channel. So that's what's going on in the vibrational frequency in megahertz of the ionosphere. That's one slice of the atmosphere located at about 300 kilometers of altitude. And here is the anomaly gram. That's the anomaly in megahertz from a 30 day median. High frequency anomalies are shown in blue. Low frequency anomalies are shown in red. Tomorrow you can expect to see a lot of red on this imagery. The ionosphere puffs up when major space weather events happen, and that, that means that there is more dense gas at those levels, and that vibrates more slowly. Anyway, there's the latest image. That's 12 o'clock Universal Time Ionogram and 12 noon Universal Time Anomalygram. We also like to show the total electron content. Why? Because it shows you the most likely places for GPS errors, and it might show you even more important signals as well. So that's that's a good reason for that, I would say, wouldn't you? And oh, and you know what? I forgot something because we forgot to show filaments. Yeah, filaments. So let's break out our 193 plus 211, 193 plus 304 angstroms from SDO. All right, there's that. That's another 24 hour video. And we like the 304 plus 193 angstroms because it is, it makes filaments pop. So again, there are multiple filaments here, at least three that could get names. And especially that one in the northern hemisphere there, it's shaped like a C. That one is a good candidate for hashtag name that filament. Again, join us on Twitter for that. And let's show that total electron content forecast. So this will show you the most likely places for GPS errors. And feel free to pause the video on this frame if you're not familiar with distances to those things in miles. So here's our coupled thermosphere, ionosphere, plasmosphere, electrodynamics model. We are seeing some significant GPS errors continuing in south of Oceania there, the Southern Ocean, the Southern Indian Ocean, Antarctica, south of Africa, the Southern Atlantic. Also some significant Northern Hemisphere total electron content anomalies. So some interesting signals showing up there. We'll let that play through one more time, and then we'll show the North American total electron content anomaly from the 10-day average. And we have seen some signals in here in the past couple of days, nothing too major today. There was a signal a couple of days ago that raised the possibility of a Cascadia earthquake, as it seems to be evident that there are some Earth-generated signals that show up in the total electron content data. A weird bridge between seismic activity and space weather. 
not generated by space, not the sun, quote, causing earthquakes, end quote, but the earth generating a signal that we see by looking at the space weather facts. So we're going to close out the DSW, that stands for Daily Space Weather Video, with the latest intensity gram and latest colorized magnetogram. So there's the latest intensity gram and there is the latest colorized magnetogram. Again, things have been mostly stable here. And these groups are not all that magnetically complex. So for example, this new group that rose right here, it is beta gamma class. If there are any deltas there, there are minor. This group here, that is beta gamma delta class, but barely. This group here is beta gamma delta class, but barely. This group here, beta gamma delta class, but barely. And the same with that group. So there is still a significant possibility of large flares, but not as high as it's been. And the instability that we're seeing at the moment is mainly coming from around this area. So that's sort of the place to watch here in the next coming hours because, hey, if that produces a major solar flare, we could see another proton event and we could see significant CMEs, additional CMEs headed toward Earth. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to check out our links. You can find a link to the homepage below the video. Smashomash.com is the homepage we launched back in 2019 in response to the pathetic, putrid, disgusting, ridiculous, evil censorship by Facebook as their share price crashed. Mark thought he invented the metaverse, which happened in the 1980s when first-person shooters became 3D. And uh, yeah, I don't know what he's talking about. No gamer is interested in the metaverse at all. It's just ridiculous. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of sort of hope their share price goes down to about one penny per share because it is utter, utter garbage. Meta. Meta, learn to do your own job. Anyway, again, we launched our own website back in 2019 because of the ridiculous censorship on Facebook. And we should, I guess we should send a thank you letter to Meta for being so bad at their own job, allowing people to see your posts. Whoops, they suck at that. It's called shadow bans. You can also follow us on another <laughs> meta platform known as Instagram. Check us out over there for regular daily fitness and lifestyle posts and so on. And once again, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can follow the hashtag name that filament. If you want to name filaments after living people, join us on Twitter. Hashtag name that filament. We just tweeted about it. So join us over there. It's the best place to share auroral imagery as well. So if you've got imagery of your own to share, hit us up on social media. You can send us a message on Instagram. You can send a you could send a imagery of of things like meteorologic or astronomical phenomenon to our Discord chat. You can find a link on the homepage to that as well at smashomash.com. All that sort of stuff you'll find there. What the heck is going on? Why do I have two Twitter tabs open? That is not a thing. And let's get to our meteorology segment, as we don't want the video to be too lengthy. And we'll start out meteorology by talking Saharan dust. So just as we forecasted here, you can see this Saharan dust continuing to be sucked up by this low, which is causing it to basically just stagnate. Also, there is some wind shear to its north. You can see a bit of a clockwise rotation right here. So there is a small anticyclone right here. You can see that is rotating clockwise. Those are the surface winds and dust. So that's a huge cloud of Saharan dust right there, which is an effective high pressure system as well. You can see that dust being sucked right into that low, which is not generally conducive to convection. So this wind shear up here is also sort of constraining it and forcing it to suck up even more dust. That low pressure there in the central Atlantic is destined to fail or stagnate at least. Major Saharan dust there tamping down that weather system. Sorry to all you hurricane hopefuls. That is not going to be a hurricane. <laughs> it's just not happening, at least not unless something suddenly changes and that dust has basically nowhere to go. So let's switch to our regularly scheduled 
meteorology stuff here on the surface winds of the eastern world shout out to our viewers from all around the planet congratulations on realizing the channel exists here is the jet stream scenario if you had to pick only one weather phenomenon to forecast major global scale weather patterns pick the jet stream this is depicting the 250 hectopascal winds which are indeed still blowing backward across the northern indian ocean backward jet stream there also the western Pacific, seeing some backward jet stream action there north of Philippines. Here are the jet streams of the west. Strong anticyclone, as we talked about right there. You can see that even in the upper level. Also an anticyclone here over Arizona. Here are the surface winds of this side of the planet. And just a quick look at sea surface temperatures here. There are the sea surface temperatures. And you can see that system is actually cooling down the water there. Again, not exactly conducive in the current situation for convection and building that system into a real hurricane. Here are the surface winds of the central world. That's, you know, the Holy Lands, Europe, Africa, the Middle East. And here are the jet streams. Trivia question. We've got a trivia question, folks. I want to know how much energy it would take to cool down this area, one degree Celsius. So there, there it is. That is the Pacific Ocean. Let me redraw that. So there's the Pacific Ocean, the world's by far largest body of water. How much energy would it take to refrigerate that to reduce all of that water by one degree Celsius? I want to know. It's probably not that hard to calculate. I just don't feel like calculating it or looking up how much water is in the Pacific Ocean or anything like that. I mean, a calorie is the amount of energy it takes to heat up one milliliter of water, one degree C. How much refrigeration would it take to cool down the entire Pacific Ocean by one degree Celsius? Let us know in the comments if you felt like doing that math. Again, I certainly didn't. But yeah, it's... Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it, it would take a lot of energy to heat up or cool down the entire Pacific Ocean and all the water in it. That's just one to grow on, folks, one to grow on. So here is the clouds and fog scenario for the Americas as we zoom in closer and closer to the lower 48. And we've got continued strong storms in the central part of the country. It has been pretty stormy. Also, it's getting pretty smoky in some areas. There is our cloud forecast, not our cloud, that's our smoke forecast. Yeah, that's what that's what it is. It's a smoke forecast. We've increased that to 5 FPS here. Let's zoom in a little bit closer. Great forecasting there for PM 2.5 particulates from firesmoke.ca. Here's your weather.gov page. We've got some flooding in the forecast and some gale warnings around Hawaii. If your location is lit, click your location. The National Weather Service page, weather.gov. And let's take a look at some forecasts. So the jet stream is what's going to characterize your weather. Here is the 250 millibar wind forecast known as the jet stream for the next 72 hours based on a GFS model. It looks like some cold air is going to be making its way down from Canada once again all the way down to Arkansas and so forth. 72 hour GFS 250 millibar wind speed forecast. Here is your GFS 72 hour pressure and precipitation forecast. A series of concentrated storms there will be expected to show up around the Gulf Coast as very strong storms are also expected to move from Colorado into Kansas and Oklahoma. Kansas is going to get kaplastered. We've been saying it for a couple of days, and that forecast has not changed. Here's your 72-hour total accumulated precipitation forecast in inches. Some rains of 4-plus inches there coming to some parts of the country. Pennsylvania going to get some serious rain once again. And here is your 72-hour GFS temperature anomaly forecast in degrees Celsius. So west of the Rockies, you're going to have mostly extreme heat. 
east of the Rockies, you're going to have mostly slightly anomalously cool temperatures, save for the Gulf states, where you'll have huge variations. Also, huge variations happening there in places like Cuba. Again, that's your 72-hour GFS total uh, GFS temperature anomaly in degrees Celsius. Moving right along to our lightning mapper. This is where the strikes have been happening for the past about 10 hours. And here's where they've been for the past about one hour. And it looks like France is devoid of lightning. Hopefully it's a clear day for the Tour de France as they're in their final week and Vote Van Art is going home because of the likelihood of his second child on the way. Anyway, there's where the lightning strikes currently are in Tennessee and Missouri. And it looks like some hot air in Colorado there has recently mixed with cool air just south of Denver. Some minor lightning strikes happening there. There's the full map. Next time you hear thunder, check it out. Lightningmaps.org could save your bacon. And we could save your bacon. Who knows? Smashomash.com slash smash team is our official subscription services site. If you want to support the content, consider becoming a member of the Smash team at the gold or silver level thanks to our new gold annual paid up subscribers. That makes a huge difference in the operation as we are in the process of starting a nonprofit science foundation because we're interested in advancing human technology and cosmology via heliophysics. So help us out by becoming a member of the Smash team. There's even a bronze level for those of you unable or unwilling to open your cobweb encrusted wallets and send us a few bucks per month. Again, the best value is the gold annual paid up subscription as it's almost like getting four months for free, what with the complimentary merch that we include. If you enjoy the content, if you're new to the channel, do yourself a favor and press the subscribe button. Press like, leave a comment, even if it's derogatory. Please don't hurt my feelings in the comments. The comments are, though, it makes me very sad when people say things that are mean to me. So please be nice to me in the comments. Boo hoo. If you haven't seen our shorts, check those out and perhaps share them with your friends and foes. They've been, shall we say, popular. Yesterday's biggest video had 1.5 thousand views. Share the shorts with your people who don't know anything about space weather and have attention spans of less than one minute. <laughs> All right, so we'll close things out with the U.S. Doppler radar map here. Let's briefly show the full 50-state view. Some storming subsiding there in Hawaii and some precipitation there across Alaska. More weather moving toward Nashville once again today. Nashville, you're in the crosshairs again. There is clouds and fog over the lower 48, depicted by 3.9 micrometer infrared radiation, part of the NASA GOES Interactive Weather Satellite Suite. And there's the water vapor map. And here's the recap of the ending of your space weather and Earth weather together. Ground-based Doppler radar systems depict vertical motion in the air column. Space-based systems depict infrared radiation showing clouds and fog at nighttime. You can use this to figure out whether you'll be able to see the aurora. If you're too lazy to look out and see if you can see stars, the shortwave radiation map will show clouds and fog at night. And there is the water vapor map. It looks like some clear skies are coming to PA here. So bring that cold air from Canada and send the nice, crisp, clear air for aurora viewing tonight. Thanks for tuning in to the Smash News Network, Least Busted Name and News. Once again, congratulations on realizing the channel exists. I've got to go make sure that the bunker is stocked with ceramic silverware because we're very worried that our silverware is going to melt, folks, from space weather. <laughs> just kidding, folks. Just kidding, folks. And to those who get that inside joke, cheers. Yeah, it's none of your business. None of your business at all. So, yeah, going back to the bunker to make sure that we are stocked. While I'm gone, may that solar wind be at your back. Whoa!